turn on this device. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Susco. I'm going to be giving a lecture on the 2AC. Um, I am the speech and debate coach at Calvert Hall College in Baltimore, Maryland. Previously, I was a coach at George Mason University for about five years, and then I debated nationally at the small school called the University of Mary Washington, and then I also debated in Erie, Pennsylvania at Cathedral Preparatory School. In terms of my experience as a 2A, um, I was double twos all throughout high school, um, and I've been coaching, obviously, 2As for years. Um, the ex advice that we're going to do today, so we're going to go at the basic level for, you know, some refresher, and then we're going to go into some detail of what happens in situations um, in, in terms of uh, specific off-case positions, and then some advice that I would encourage all of you to do um, as you're debating the 2A, because a lot of what you do in the 2AC starts before the tournament begins, starts in pre-round prep, starts when you're actually making your blocks. Very few of the things that you do matter in the margins of actually in the round. Um, what you do beforehand of you know predicting what arguments are going to be read is the things that actually matter going into a debate. So that pre-round prep is extremely, extremely important that um, goes into it. So we're going to talk about the basics of the 2AC, get into some advice, and then we'll stop the record and um, go for some Q&A. Um, with that being the case, our Zoomers, can you see the chalkboard? Is that, do you need me to zoom in a little bit? Okay, we got, we got one, we got two. So <clears throat> we're going to go position by position, and we're going to go in terms of 2AC order. So for our people that are um, in person, what is the first position that you take? And um, for people that aren't in my lab, if we can do names. So what's the first thing when you, you give the order, what do you go first? Yes. Go for case, yeah. So this is actually a relatively um, recent phenomenon. Um, when I was in, debating in college, you would always go for topicality. Um, so why why would you go for case? Why why case? Yeah, go ahead. Pretty much like your case in the base of your argument, although the argument could be made, you go for procedural first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the basic um, tenant for any order in the case, obviously, is if drop equal lose, right? So that's why historically people would put topicality on the bottom, on the top, because if you're not topical and the judge and you all believe that you um, aren't topical, then you automatically lose the debate. That's why you do case after that. Um, but you know, nowadays modern debaters do case at the top, counter plans go after that. And then there's a competing theory between disadvantage or critique, which we'll kind of get into. There isn't really a correct idea for that. Now, I, we did at the beginning of the lab, I, at the beginning of the session of how many of you have been eight off before. In modern debate, when you're at a varsity tournament, people are going to read four to seven off case in a bunch of case arguments, right? You're getting overwhelmed by case arguments. So something that you have to decide between is the idea of a kind of a pendulum of efficiency, clarity, and actually answering the argument. So you have clarity on one side. You have um, answering the argument. And then we're basically trying to get to this middle part of having efficiency as you're going through your 2AC. Typically, and this is, you know, within a range of arguments, uh, within a range of situations, you want to spend anywhere between 45 seconds to a minute 30 on case. If you're getting five or six off and you're spending three minutes on case, a lot of times that's gonna be a time trade-off that's gonna punish you on the disadvantage, punish you on the critique. So it's your job to be 
as efficient as possible with also having that clarity um, with it. And the general rule for this is going back, remember, I'm gonna be talking a lot about preparation that goes into the 2AC. So this is something that'll happen through our practice debates and through our debates um, themselves, but um, it'll make more sense in about 30 seconds. So let's talk about when to read card on case. When do you think it's appropriate to read a card on case in the 2AC? Yes. If your app, if your app doesn't answer it. Okay. Um, what's another situation? So that's kind of general, but what's a situation where you'll typically read cards on case? We'll typically read cards on case. Um, go ahead. Maybe if you're reading like a 2AC add-on. A 2AC add-on, sure. Um, and we'll talk about add-ons as well. Um, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Um, it, second row, name? Eileen, go ahead. Specific solvency evidence. Yep. When they read a term. Okay. So here's the rule of thumb with reading case arguments, uh, cards on case. You should <clears throat> never, never, never read cards on case unless your 1AC doesn't answer it. If you are reading a case card three, four debates in a row, that card should be in the 1AC. Because that means that there's an a argument that is on the debate multiple times. So for example, Let's say, um, you know, there's a big component of will NATO say yes or not, right? Um, will they accept the security cooperation? So if people are challenging you a bunch on security cooperation, say the say yes debate, um, if that's in every single case debate, that should probably be in a solvency contention because when you're reading a case card, depending on your speed, so some of us are some speed racers, some of us are slow as molasses, a bunch of us are in the middle, that 25 seconds matters on the critique position, on the counterplan position that you're going to. So it's our goal to make sure we actually answer the argument and to make sure we're clear, but to make sure we're as efficient as possible because we need to make the life of the negative difficult. Otherwise, we're going to get blown out of the water going into the negative block. So that's the first rule of thumb. If you are reading the same case card multiple times in multiple debates, that should become a 1AC card. So that's kind of where you'll make adjustments as you're um, going into debate. The second way time you should be reading case cards is when you're getting impact turned. When there is a turn, when there is a, some people will put disadvantages on the case. Some people will do impact turns. One of the things that'll make high school debates lose immediately is by not reading enough cards on it. I've watched multiple debates where somebody will just extend a 1AC impact card and then they won't go through the entire process. So you should also treat impact turns, you should treat turns case, or, um, case turns as if disadvantages are being read. So if a disadvantage is read against us, right? Say it's the dip cap DA, say it's the midterms DA, you would put three or four cards on the case. So sometimes people will put disadvantages on the case um, to trick people or to make, um, make it seem like it's um, hiding under the radar or something. That is when you should read case arguments. So the next thing I'll talk about um, here, let's move this up a little bit. Okay. The last thing on case, okay, is when to kick. Okay. So people in the room, um, raise your hand if the 1AC in your lab has four impacts. 
does the 1AC in your lab have four impacts, four distinct impacts? Okay. Uh, raise your hand if it's more than four impacts, if you have more than four impacts in the 1AC. Interesting. So we, some of these 1ACs are only, is it only two impacts? Oh, interesting. Okay. So a lot of times with a 1AC, you'll have four or five impacts, right? And the whole goal of having multiple impacts in a 1AC is to spread out your opponent. It's to allow them to provide a couple answers. And if they don't answer it, you extend a conceded scenario and move that along. But the idea when you're kicking is you only need, you only need one, this is my exclamation point with an X is my shorthand for impact, impact in the two AR. You only need one impact in the two AR. So if you are being crunched for time, a lot of times, you know, at this point in your debate careers, you'll drop an advantage in the 1AR, right? You can do that earlier in the 2AC to get a time trade-off because there isn't a large benefit, say it's a K debate. If you have three extinction scenarios, that doesn't really get you anywhere that the one extinction scenario would get. If you're debating a counterplan strategy, you need a deficit to one advantage typically. So you only need one or two impacts. Maybe you'll need an impact that is a tiebreaker impact. Um, yep, in the back. Um, how do you know which one to draw? Because sometimes an impact is specific to like an argument. Like, and like, how do you know which one's going to be the best to draw? Like, what if like you drop it, drop two of them, and then like, you end up losing the other one. Yeah, so the we'll, we'll get into that on the counterplan part of this discussion. But typically, you'll know the utility of your advantages. So for example, a lot of people will construct a 1AC that has a very fast time frame. And having a 1AC with a fast time frame, the reason that you would have that is so that you can win a delay deficit to a process counterplan. So if your impact is coming in the next two, three months, then a counterplan whose process starts, you know, in December and then gets implemented in April won't solve that counterplan. So if you are debating a process counterplan where you need to go for a delay deficit, not all of your advantages have delay deficits. So for example, for the India app that's going to get posted sometime this week for the other labs, there is a warming component to that. And the warming impact does not solve immediately, obviously, right? The warming impact is going to be occurring down the line. So it does not have a good delay deficit. The same thing is true for a certainty deficit or signaling deficit. So you'll know which of your advantages is easily solved by counter, counter plans and what is the purpose of it. It's the same reason why on this topic, everybody has like a NATO, um, counter, uh, NATO key argument so that it can answer the you know what counter plan or the EU counter plan. So knowing the purposes is the easiest question. Knowing the purposes of your scenarios will help a lot. Okay. So these are just some tips that go into the the case debate. Okay. So yes. So when you're dropping in, can you still have the next No, you can see the defense. Yeah. You'll concede the defense. You should never read impact defense against yourself because that's just a waste of time. But you specifically concede the defense and then go into it. Okay. How many of you read overviews in the 2AC? Case overviews? Yeah. Um, don't do that. So, what you should do for overviews in the 2AC is oftentimes redundant because a overview in the 2AC is just an extension of your impact. If they do, impact defense, you're extending the impact anyway. So it's redundant on both of those levels. Typically, a case overview should just be highlighting a drop. So like if they drop the warming impact, you know, you do a small overview at the top, which is just, you know, warming impact is conceded, a claim of the extinction argument, and then moving on from there. 
Um, but again, this is something that as you get more efficient with your two ACs will become um, more obvious. Now topicality, um, we're not gonna get into the basics of topicality, um, but there are a couple of things that people do that you should kind of be aware of. Um, the first one is slow down. Okay. When people are on T, think of it like a theory block, right? When somebody reads a conditionality block to you, maybe it's five or six points, how many realistically do you get on your flow? Two, right? Maybe if you have a really good shorthand. So oftentimes, if there's a key argument, so one of my coaches told me that on any tag, on any card, the judge only flows the first six words, right? But in a T debate, we'll go through like two we meets and a counter interpretation within like seven seconds. So slowing down now, I'm not saying conversational pace, but having a hard emphasis on what your explanation is after the tagline, right? So what's the start of every T2AC? What's the start of every T2AC? The we meet debate, right? So everybody gets to we meet. Um, for me, my shorthand for we meet is WM. But a lot of times a judge won't actually know what the we meet argument is because they just blow through it so quickly because it's treated like a theory block. Now, this is the same thing with clarity and efficiency of you can't spend a minute 30 on T, you know, somewhere you want between like 45 seconds to a minute, depending on the strength of the T argument. But you also have to make sure that you're communicating that idea so that the judge knows at least what is the we meet argument going into it. Now, another thing that a lot of people do um, on T that I don't find to be super helpful is um, more defense. So it's not a good idea. That's my um, shorthand for not, um, at least when um, I'm making files. I either do that or I do this. So what's a defensive argument on T? What's, a, what's an argument that people love throwing on T? Functional limits check, okay. What's another one? Don't vote on potential abuse, literature checks abuse, right? Um, reasonability doesn't count, okay? At minimum, you should have a we meet debate. You should have a counter interpretation that also has offense. And that's where you get at your standards. As, well, this is my shorthand for standards. Because a lot of times when somebody does a 2AC, you basically have two options going into um, a debate. You have the reasonability we meet debate, right? Which, you know, sometimes T violations, debaters are just wrong on their description of your affirmative or they are correct, and you kind of have to get into that debate. So um, how many of you had to debate like the CCU's T violation last year, right? That was like the most common T argument on that topic, made zero sense, but the card said CCU's. 99% um, of affirmatives on that topic did not CCU's, so you had to get into that. So a lot of times you'll have to have a counterinterpretation that has offense. Sometimes people won't extend offense on their counterinterpretations, and that's what they'll they'll get into a bad spot. You always have to at least attempt to make a limits argument because the neg is always going to go for limits, right? And then you'll have some component of an education argument or a predictability argument.
the last thing I'll say that um, a lot of people will lose at least a debate on is with modern tea debates, um, people are super, super shady. So you'll find that um, people, so I'll, I'll put it right here. Look for hidden violations. So what, what do I mean by hidden violations? Anybody want, want to wager a guess? If you're on the Northeast, this is something that Bronx Science does. They'll put a spec in like the standards. Some people put effects T or they'll put extra T. And this is just like the equivalent of somebody reading a disadvantage that has two impacts, right? So it's something that you wanna be aware of as you're going through a T debate. So look for hidden violations. Look for hidden violations. And Zoom people, can we, we're, okay. It looks like you're good at seeing that. Sorry, I wish my camera was better. Okay. So questions about topicality. Yeah, go ahead. What if like, um, they don't provide their own like, interpretation? What if they just say it's like, so like, let's say they say they were giving you green and the end is like, hey, you violate the, the tea or something like that. And then what if you're asking them about the like, so like, you're doing the argument to yourself like, oh, they never gave us the interpretation of what it is. Mm -hmm. How do you argue based off that? Because then it's like, what are they not saying? Because they, they kind of like, you know what I mean? Um, so a lot of situations that probably won't occur because a T violation has to have interpretation at the top. Um, but if it just starts at the violation base, you can say that their interpretation is um, under limiting uh, because there is no context of why it's specifically there, right? So that's kind of where you punish them for not having an interpretation is you need it. Otherwise, it is under limiting and there is no um, stasis, there's no stable way to answer that argument. So we're going down the line, obviously, of if you drop this, do you lose? So we, we put case first, we do T. What would be our next off case position that we would do? Our next off case position. Disad, why is that? Oh, that's fine. Anybody else want to wager your guess? Yes. Yeah. So counter plan typically is what you'll do next. And it's because if you concede it, if you concede a counter plan, all they have to do is win a net benefit and then the debate's over. So it's all about concessions, right? If you typically will put a disadvantage last, because if you can see a disadvantage, you at least have the case to weigh against. Um, because people can still win debates even if you drop a disadvantage. A lot of times, um, you know, 99 out of 100 times if you drop a counter plan, unless there, if there is actually no, no net benefit, then you'll be in a bad spot, okay? So, there is, I'm sure we're familiar with the acronym for um, answering a 2AC. So can anybody tell me what the S is? Just shout it out. Solvency deficit. P is permutation. O is offense. And then lastly, T is for theory. Every, every 2AC has to contain all four components. Every, every 2AC needs to contain that. One surefire way to lose a debate, and this happens so often in nine-off debates, seven-off debates, is you're so rushed for time, you don't go through every single process. Some people say that the first thing you should always do, just like muscle memory, counterplan, perm, do both right? To always get that perm in. 
And then to go along those lines, uh, making sure you have your solvency deficit, and then having some type of theory argument. Now, we're going to go on the solvency deficit first. And this kind of goes along the lines of preparing you for what kind of debates you're going to be in. So what I mean by that is this is goes into the construction of your 1AC beforehand. So you're making your 1ACs right now, and you have a US key argument, you have a NATO key argument, and then you probably you presumably have a security cooperation key argument, right? A lot of times, if your 1AC is constructed properly, you only have to read a solvency deficit on the mechanism of the counterplan itself, right? Because you can say our 1AC card says why the US is key to answer the EU counterplan. And then you can read an EU count an EU fails on your specific area. Yeah, go ahead. So security cooperation. Yep, security cooperation. Now, these are the basic ones that you're going to have. You'll typically also have a delaying deficit. And you'll have a certainty key slash signaling argument. And when we were talking about the case debate of, you know, what, what impact, what advantage do you drop? It really depends on the strength of what the neg is going for. So say it's just a, you know, disad one counterplan that counterplans EU. You don't really need to mix up your strategy all that much. But a lot of times you'll know what your advantage is that has the best certainty key argument the best delayed deficit. And then that's the advantage you're basically stuck with. Now, two ends that realize that, a smart two end will overload on the advantage that they know you extend beforehand. And that is a kind of next level thing that two ends on the national circuit will do. But going into all of these, US key, NATO key, secure cooperation key, are extremely important, okay? So you need to always make sure you have a solvency deficit to the counter plan. Most of the time that solvency deficit should be in your 1AC, right? The same strategy is true from case debate. If you read the same case card in three, four debates, that should be a 1AC card. If you're reading the same certainty key, the same US key argument on case, every single debate, every you know three, four debates, that should be a 1AC card um, if it's going to always be there. Okay. So we have firm offense. You typically won't read a card on offense. If you get to your solvency deficit, your offense is the case arguments. All right. Why wouldn't it be good to read like a disadvantage to a counter plan? Why is it not the most beneficial use of your time to read? like an EU DA to an EU counterplan, for example, or uh, say they read the DOS counterplan that was put together. Why might it not be a good idea to read a DOS disadvantage to a DOS counterplan? <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah, you probably, you're probably gonna go for the perm for sure. Um, but the more realistic thing is <coughs> a two one will just kick it, right? Positions tend to be conditional. So if you put offense on it, if you spend like 45 seconds or a minute 15 reading a disadvantage on a counter plan, if I were as a two end and I had to go for conditionality anyway, I would just kick it and then go for a different position. So for theory, you should almost always have some conditionality argument. Um, 
I'd encourage you to go to, I'm hopefully a bunch of you are going to um, Clarman's conditionality lecture. If not, um, you know, I'm sure there's gonna be a bunch of conditionality debates. It's definitely a huge argument in the toolbox for um, two A's. We should have some theory argument. Now, this is where there's competing theories that people will have of how much theory is too much theory, right? Some people will, um, they'll do international fiat bad, they'll do process counter plans bad, they'll do conditionality bad. And there really isn't a right or wrong answer. I would say that conditionality is the only one where you can get the team to lose, you know, reject the team for it. A lot of times with like process counter plan, theory bad or international fiat bad, you're not going to vote the team down. It's very difficult to convince a judge to vote them down. But process, process counter plan theory is very beneficial because it can also get you offense when you're extending a permutation. It can be a, a justification. Well, if process counter plans are bad because they artificially inflate net benefits that don't actually exist, that justifies permutation to do the plan through the process of the counter plan. So even though you're not gonna win a debate rejecting a team for a process counter plan, theory bad or international fiat bad, it can justify permutations that have a benefit to you. Um, questions about counter plans. Questions about counter plans. Um, all right, let's see. Do we have any, we have space left? Let's look like it, okay. So what do you think the next one is that we're gonna talk about? Disadvantages or critiques? If you were a 2A, after you get to the counter plan, which one would you put first? The critique? All right, make a, make a justification for it. I think um, strategically, if we're talking about how you stem the PAP in a limited manner with the time constraints you have, I think putting more offense on the criticism would be easier to go, and if you have offense on the criticism in a limited amount of time, would be better. And I think it takes structurally for me at least to take more time to use offense on the criticism than on the criticism. Okay. So I don't disagree with that. Um, this is kind of a, your preference as a 2A. So I'm gonna put, we're gonna talk about disadvantages right now. And for 2As, there's kind of two competing theories, which is you, some people put the most strong position that they want the most time on at the end of the 2AC. So, you know, they read the security K, I know they're going for the security K. I want to finish everything else super quick so that I can put two minutes, 2.30 on the security K. And they are very good at time management so they can do that. Some people are terrible at time management, all right? They can't even, they barely make it to lab on time. Um, their life is a mess, their room is a mess. I'm sorry if you have a roommate like that right now. Um, they're just a complete slob. And some people will say, I only need 30 seconds on a position. So let's say that's the dip cap DA for example. I can take out the dip cap in 15, 30 seconds. So I should put that at the bottom. So the, it really depends on knowing your opponent and being like, all right, this um, debater's two and R on the wiki is K, 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 K. Then it should be that, it should be the bottom. Or it's midterms, politics, midterms, politics, midterms, politics. It really just depends on the debater themselves and the situation. On top of that, also the judge too. Are they a judge that has, you know, two, three paragraphs about the K or they're like, I am never gonna vote for this whatsoever. So it's really some competing ideas of where you're going into it. So the disadvantage conversation is not gonna be super long, okay? But this is where pre-round prep comes into it. So when you are answering a disadvantage, you should have 
a clear strategy. Have a clear strategy. So, that could be a straight turn. T slash return, where you have a link turn and you read a non unique argument. That could be um, if a disadvantage 100% does not apply to your affirmative, right? So, say, I don't know if this is true for any of your affirmatives, but say for the affirmatives that your lab are cutting, you have a clear argument why your affirmative can be DOS, right? They read DOD, DA. There's clearly no link because your your counter your affirmative goes through the process of the DOS. So it could be a no link strategy. And then it could uh, theoretically be an impact turn, but I would never encourage you to impact turn in the 2AC. Um, very few times do I think that's a good idea. So why might it be a bad idea to impact turn in the 2AC? Or, or, all right, would you like to justify why you should impact turn? No. Okay, why might it be bad? To, or do you have a separate question? Yeah, I was just saying, um, when would be like the best time to impact turn? So, you very rarely should impact turn um, unless you think you are in a stronger position, which most impact turns are lies, right? Like econ decline good is just, you're gonna lose a debate where it's like evidence versus evidence in a lot of examples. Sometimes you have to be like just something. Mm -hmm. It will be like, it's just like, like so don't think of, don't think about it in terms of the strength of the argument. Think about it in terms of time management. So say for example, they read a EU counter plan, okay, and the deficit, the net benefits midterms. I believe the net benefit, sorry, the DA, the impact to midterms is econ. Is that right? It's like an inflation argument, right? So say. Um, Okay, so say that say that's that's their those are their two off case, right? If you were to impact turn econ, right? So read DDEV, um, you wouldn't have to go to the EU counter plan because you're impact turning the net benefit. So the times where it's good to go for an impact turn is when you're going for an all end strategy. So for example, say you want to DDEV the net benefit right? And there's only one counter plan, one net benefit. You could concede all of case. You can concede the um, EU counter plan and you can DDEV for like six minutes because the impact turn is now your new advantage. And you're basically starting the debate over at the 2AC at the 2NC. Now, the reason you don't want to impact turn is because they have the neg block so they can read more cards, but it just depends on the speed of people. So for example, my top team this past year, we would impact turn um, because I had a very we had a very fast 1A. So the 1A would read somewhere around, you know, 10 to 15 cards in any given 1AR. Um, so he could reintroduce the debate going into the 1AR. So that's a question of speed. And do you think you have the goods? Some people don't have impact turn files, right? So if you think, oh, Cyber war good, they're not gonna be able to handle this. Oh, Russia war good, they're not gonna be able to handle this, which is true, right? Some people don't go for those disadvantages so they don't have the Russia war bad stuff. They don't have the cyber war um, impact work. That's what should go into it because you're always gonna be at a time disadvantage for that impact turn, if that makes sense. Um, so you wanna have a clear strategy going into the 2AC on the disadvantage. And this is something that you with your lab will talk about. And during the year, this is something you should talk about with your um, teammates, which is what's the argument that, what's the disadvantage that we're most worried about? Is it a China lash out DA? Is it a Russia lash out DA? 
Is it, um, you know, a process DA, like a DOD or a DOS um, argument? Because then when you assess the strengths of those, that goes into how much time you should be spending in the 2AC on it. So for example, if you, th this, uh, this is the equivalent of how many of you, for example, had the EPA um, DA in your 1NCs last year? Okay, one, all right. So um, what was your throwaway DA last year? What was your throwaway DA that you had? No DAs last year? Okay. So uh, I know a lot of teams read rider DAs, right? They'd have like that Fallon DA, they had these Fiat DAs. Um, but a lot of times there weren't those throwaway DAs, but if they were, you don't want to spend a ton of time on them because you basically want to bluff them into going for it. Because there's so many structural problems with those DAs that if they do go for it, you can probably win on an analytical argument. So the DA, you should have a clear strategy going into that, a clear strategy going into it. Okay. So I am going to, we're going to move to the critique. Okay. No, uh, we'll just say no. Yeah. Um, Let's say they like did a counterpoint and they like, like they're really good and they were able to like get through a lot. Mm -hmm. What's going to be the best thing to drop? Like, what thing you don't have time to get through? Again? Um, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. So, the critique. <clears throat> so, I'll start with. Um, you should get notes from Turner's uh, 2AC to the K, um, because that is going to be much more beneficial. We're going to go into, you know, in more detail about that specific position. But there are just some clear arguments that you need to have and that you need to be thinking about beforehand. So you're, you're going to have a framework argument. You're going to have a permutation. And then this is where pre-round prep goes into um, the conversation, OK? So there are teams that go for a link defense plus perm strategy. That's option one. And option two is defend your impact. But you should know what your affirmative does beforehand. So what I mean by that is, you know, we've heard the term soft left, right? Soft left affirmatives before, where an affirmative does not solve for large impacts. It makes a tangible, um, change that will solve for maybe a structural violence impact, a rights-based impact, et cetera. The purpose of that affirmative is to no link out of the critique or solve for a tangible connection to it. So you'll see teams that will be reading natives affirmatives last year. You'll see teams that are reading, you know, some IR component um, this year. That is what you would go for, is you go for the permutation and link defense, because a lot of times critiques have difficulty getting offense, they'll do that at the impact level. Now, this is something that you have to have a discussion about with your team, a discussion about with your um, coaches beforehand, but most people go uh, defending your impact level of, listen, warming is a big impact, we need to have clear, tangible reasons to stop warming, having debates about warming are beneficial, um, and having an ontological defense of it, an epistemological defense of it, et cetera. So you will do that work beforehand, because a lot of times you can apply all of those things in any given debate. You'll obviously want a specific defense of a critique. So um, you know, with this emerging tech K, you'll have like a specific response to Virilio. Um, if you debate Neolib, you'll have a specific response. You'll probably have some transition argument of we aren't going to actually get this transition. So you'll have a specific response. 
But going into the round, the 2AR, unless something drastically goes wrong, will typically be somewhere on the lines of the blink defense and perm strategy or the defending your impact strategy. Okay. Um, so it's something to think about going into that pre-round prep. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So um, if anybody has any questions on the critique, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we're going to do some kind of last minute tips that go into the 2AC. Great. <clears throat> so this is the one. These are just some general tips on what you should do in certain situations, okay? So general tips. So this is six plus off. What do you do in that situation? When somebody six offs you, nine offs you, 11 offs you, um, that's a good thing, actually. If you can structurally understand what is happening, you are in a strong position. Somebody that nine offs you, is doing that because they don't have jack against your affirmative. They're throwing stuff at the wall. And of those nine arguments, say you get nine offed, look at their wiki. They're going for the same two, three positions every time. So you have to realize that a lot of positions are just going to be a time trade-off. They're just a time suck that you don't actually have to answer in order to get to those positions. So when you get... Six plus off, all right? One, you have immediately have theory um, because conditionality will be an option for you. And then make strategic concessions. So, that might be dropping an advantage. So the one in speed, one in C spends 45 seconds reading case cards. If you drop that advantage, you gain that 45 seconds in the two AC to answer something else. If you, um, you know, this might be a time where you can see both of the advantages. Hey, Jacob, you, um, and then you just impact turn or you straight turn a net benefit, for example. A lot of times too, is you want to punish in consistency. So when somebody's rushing to do a nine off, what they might do, for example, is has anybody ever read three T violations against you? Three T, three T violations? If somebody reads three T violations against you, that is an unwinnable argument because you can stick them to the idea that topicality is not like a counterplay where you can just kick at any point. They're saying that the only topical affirmative meets all three of those interpretations. So you can easily win an over-limiting debate of what affirmative meets your with violation, your security cooperation violation, and your cybersecurity cooperation. Chances are a 1N hadn't thought about that and will just be saying, uh, 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 in the 1NC. And then you can beat them on, they don't have an argument to answer no over limits. Their interpretation allows for zero apps and then go along those lines. You can also extend global offense or global defense, right? So you say reasonability, apply that to both violations so that you're not reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. That can be true for a deficit to a counter plan. That can be true to, um, you know, two disadvantages might have the same defense that's on top of that, et cetera. Okay. Um, so 
that's what you do. Those are a couple things that you can do against um, six off. A lot of times you'll kind of think of what is the most beneficial for you specifically with that. Okay. Um, I will maybe try and send out some notes or something. I have a couple other tips um, that I'll try and throw in or talk to your lab about including. Um, but we're going to stop there um, so that you can walk over to your next one that starts in about five minutes. So I'm going to pause the recording.